In this video, we're going to see an example of the quantum order finding subroutine of Shor's factoring algorithm for the inputs n equals 15 and a equals 11. These are our input values. We also need to specify the number of qubits in the two registers which we will be dealing with. The number of qubits in register 1 is denoted by m, and that is equal to 3. The number of qubits in register 2 is denoted by L, and that is equal to 4. L is also the number of bits that are required to specify N in binary. So 15 is a 4-bit number. It takes 4 bits to represent 15 in binary. And it's actually a string of 4 ones. And that is the same as 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. So those values sum to give 15. And that's shown in its decimal form over here. So now that we have uh, defined what all these parameters are, uh, let's have a look at the four steps in the quantum order finding subroutine. Step one is initialization. We're going to initialize the two registers of qubits. By convention, register one is on the left and register 2 is on the right. We're initializing register 1 in all zeros. So it's a string of three zeros. It's 3 because m is equal to 3. So we have a string of m zeros, and we can write that more condensedly as a single zero over here. So what do we mean by that? We mean we are initializing all of the qubits in the first register in the computational basis state that is labeled by zero. And so that is the first register. The second register is initialized in the state 1. So we can write this 1 condensedly in this form, or we can write it out in this full form. So we have a string of three zeros followed by a 1. So we have L minus 1 zeros followed by a 1. And in total, we have L qubits in this second register. So the first three qubits are initialized in the computational basis state labeled by zero, and the last one is initialized in the computational basis state labeled by one. This is the initialization of the two registers. Next, step two involves creating a superposition in the first register. This can be done by applying a Hadamard gate to all of the qubits in the first register. So what does that actually do? It takes this state, 0, 0, 0, and it maps it to a linear combination, or in other words, a superposition of all of the computational basis states for a three qubit system. So we're dealing with a three qubit system over here because m is equal to three. And the dimension of the Hilbert space of a three qubit system is eight. Eight is two to the power of three. And these are actually the binary representations of the numbers going from 0 to 7. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So we stop at 7, and we do go on to 8. So you can see in this sum over here, we start at the value k equals 0, and we go up to 2 to the 3 minus 1. So 2 to the 3 is equal to 8, and minus 1, that gets us to 7. And that uh, minus 1 over here is because we are starting at 0. So we begin counting from 0, and then we get to 1 less than the dimension of the Hilbert space. And note that there is also a normalization coefficient out the front over here. The second register remains in this state 1. So we can write it condensely in this form, or we can write it out in full. We can write it as 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is step two. We have created a superposition of all of the computational basis states for register one. Step three involves implementing the black box procedure. And we can call this modular exponentiation. So this is the procedure of modular exponentiation. What are we doing over here? We are implementing a sequence of controlled unitary gates. And we have elaborated on this in, in the general case, but now we're going to see the effect for this specific case. So we're looking for the specific case where 
A is equal to 11 and N is equal to 15. And you can see that what's happened to the second register. We've gone from one and we've gone to this state over here. And what is very important to note is that this value of K, this index for the states of the first register, is the same value as this exponent. So we're raising 11 to the power of K. So we're, these values are not independent of each other. They are the same value. We have a K here and a K here. And an observation that we can make is that all of the even values of K are going to give one over here, and all of the odd values of K are going to give 11. That's because 11 squared is equal to one mod 15. And what we have is an alternating pattern. When we go 11 to the power of zero, we start off at one. And then when we have 11 to the power of one, we're at 11. And then every time we alternate, we're going to go back and forth between 0, 11, 0, 11, until we reach the end, until we reach this state over here, state 7. So we can group these terms into two groups. We have this group over here, all the even values, and all of the odd values over here. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And all of the even values, they are associated with the this state one in the second register, and all of the odd values are associated with this state 11 in the second register. And notice that this normalization coefficient over here is two to the minus one. And if we bring this normalization coefficient out the front, we can collect those terms, and that will give us this factor of two to the minus three on two. But I've specifically put this normalization coefficient over here because we can identify this state and this state. And now, when we go over to step four, this involves applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. So what is that going to do to these states? These states over here are going to remain unchanged. We're only applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. So we're going to take this state over here and this state over here, and those are going to be the inputs. And the outputs, when we uh, feed this into the inverse quantum Fourier transform, we're going to get these states over here. And there are some very important patterns that we can notice. So first, let's have a look at the spacing between the values over here, or the period of those values. Here we have a period of two. We're hopping up in values of two. So we have plus two, plus two, plus two. And that's the same over here. We have plus two, plus two, plus two. When we apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform, we're going to get a period of four. So we go zero and then four, zero and then four. And one thing that you may notice is that over here, we're dealing with the even values. And then when we go to the odd values, we're applying a shift. This is a little offset. It's an offset of one. So this, the spacing is the same, but we've started at one instead of zero. And that offset translates into a phase factor. So this minus one over here, that is a phase factor. So that is what the inverse quantum Fourier transform does. And we're going to see this explicitly when we look at the matrix for the inverse quantum Fourier transform for a three qubit system. That's what we're dealing with here. We have a three qubit system in the first register and we're applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform. And that gets us from this state to this state and this state to this state. So we've gone from a period of two to a period of four. And we've also introduced a phase factor, and that phase factor is a result of this offset, because we're not starting from zero, we're starting from one. But it's important to notice that the spacing is the same. The only difference is the starting value, and that translates to those phase factors. So now we have this form over here. This is the result of applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. And you can also see that the normalization coefficient has changed because we no longer have four terms, we only have two terms. And now what we can do is expand these terms out and we can reorganize them into another two sets of terms. So notice that over here where we have zero, 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 it appears here and here. So it, it, can, it can be paired with this term and with this term over here. And both of those terms are going to have a plus sign. So when we uh, pull out this 000 from the left, we're going to be left with this term over here. 
And similarly, we can do uh, a thing for 1, 0, 0. We can factor 1, 0, 0 from the left, and we can group these guys over here, and we're going to get a minus sign as a coefficient of 1, 0, 1, 1. So that is going to produce this t state over here. So we have a superposition of 1 and 11, and we have another superposition of 1 and 11 with a minus sign. This is a relative phase factor. So note that uh, this sequence of bits over here, this encodes 11. We have 1, 0, 1, 1. This is 8 plus 2 plus 1. There's no 4 over here. That's what this 0 is telling us. So 4 does not appear in this uh, bit representation over here, in this binary representation. What are these superposition states? They are the eigenstates of the unitary operator that we used to perform the modular expon exponentiation procedure. So we've seen these in the previous video. So these eigenstates are very important. And we can call these eigenstates lambda sub s. So the two values of s are 0 and 1. That means we can write this form over here more compactly. We can write it in this format. So we have a normalization coefficient. Then we have a sum over the index s going from 0 to 1. But 1 is the same as 2 minus 1. And 2 is a very special value over here because 2 is actually the order of 11. So 11 squared is equal to 1. That means that 2 is the minimum positive integer such that 11 to the power of that integer is equal to 1 mod 15. That is by definition the order of 11. So that is why uh, we have this format over here. So the states over here in this first register they can be written in this format, where we have 2 to the 3, that is 8. This is the dimension of the Hilbert space in the first register. And then we have s divided by 2. 2 is r, the order. And s is this index which we are summing over. So note that we can also write this in a more condensed form. We can write this as 4 times s. So we're only going to have two values. We're going to have 0 and 4. And what about in the second register? Well, the second register is just the eigenstates of that unitary operator that we're using to perform the modula uh, modular exponentiation procedure. And what is really, really interesting over here is that if we take the sum of these eigenstates, we're going to get the state 0, 0, 0, 1. So have a look at these two states. If we add this state to this state, we have a plus sign and a minus sign over here. Those are going to cancel. So we're only going to be left with this state, which is the 0, 0, 0, 1 state. And because we have two copies, we're going to have a factor of 2. That factor of 2 is going to multiply this normalization coefficient of 2 to the minus 1 half. So then we're going to have a factor of 2 to the plus 1 half. And if we move that factor of 2 to the plus 1 half to the other side of the equation, we're going to have 2 to the minus 1 half. So this is satisfied. This is an observation we can make about the eigenstates appearing in this expression. Now, when we're in this fourth state over here, after we have applied the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register, we can now perform measurements on the first register. And the results of those measurements are either going to be 0 or 4. And from that, we can conclude this form of the expression over here. And we can actually conclude that the order is equal to 2. So because we're only dealing with a small order, that is r equals 2, uh, it is, it's not very useful to use this procedure to find the order of 11. But we have seen a proof of concept. In the next video, we're going to see how this works for 7. So a value of a equals 7. And the order of 7 is 4. So that's going to be more useful because we're going to have a larger order and we're going to be able to uh, see more values appearing over here as possible outcomes for the measurement of the first register. So you can find that video in the same playlist. And what we're going to be doing is examining the first few steps and then looking at the final step and how it is different from this procedure over here for the input A equals 11. This initialization step is going to be the same. And step two, creating superposition, is also going to be the same. The only difference is we're going to have, uh, instead of 11, we're going to have 7 over here. And then that's going to produce a different combination of states in this part and 
those states are going to get mapped to different states when we apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. You can uh, see that video and compare it to the expressions in this video.